represent ASLD. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, yeah, I, I know. But and what we didn't want, I, yeah. you know, I, I wasn't involved in it. And, and I think what you don't want had is any chance to travel to Apago to Our Lady during the pandemic time because so no. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, ready? Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Please take your seats, if you so choose, or not. <laughs> Welcome to the NAFLD Nomenclature Recap. Good afternoon. My name is Laurie DeLev, and I'm president of ASLD. And my colleagues will in introduce themselves in a moment. Thank you so much for joining us today for this incredibly important discussion. Today's session presents another critical step in a lengthy journey to come to a global consensus on the NAFLD nomenclature. Establishing something of this magnitude is not easy. Opinions differ. Some may feel it's easier to just make a quick decision and move forward. And indeed, that would be easier, but then we would inevitably find ourselves in the same situation we're already in. By engaging in a thorough, rigorous, scientific, an established process, the Delphi process, that has global representation and participation from 250 stakeholders representing 58 countries, we can be sure that the decision we land on will be the best one. We may each have our own ideas and opinions on what the final nomenclature should be, but we all care about the outcome and only by working together can we be certain that all voices are heard and considered. The steering committee has done their utmost to ensure that everyone was invited to the table and had the opportunity to participate in this truly global effort. Together, the primary aim has been to use scientific methodology to consider all facets of the nomenclature. This effort is so much more than just the name. It's finding a solution that best answers all the issues related to the name and definition. Our meeting in July in Chicago helped us get even more focused on the path, possible pathways forward, which led to the third survey round. Today, this committee is here to present those results and discuss where this process can go next. I'm joined today by my global colleagues from Isla and Ale, We've had an equal and active role in this process, and I welcome them now to say a few words. Thomas? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Laurie. A warm welcome also from, from my side. My name is Thomas Burke. I'm currently the ESL Secretary, um, yeah, or Secretary General of ESL, and it's a pleasure to be here and to join this nomenclature meeting. I only want to start with a brief comments on why a nomenclature and why it's so important to have a nomenclature consensus um, in the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And first, I think it becomes obvious that the use of a term alcoholic for a disease that per definition excludes alcohol intake is really stigmatizing. And I think it further cements this unhealthy narrative, we all know that our patients face with liver disease, that they are always suspected that the disease is caused by themselves by increased alcohol intake. And I think the second point is that it's not purposeful to define a disease which is triggered by various etiopathogenicities just by excluding alcohol and not by positive criteria. And I think this led to the introduction of the term muffled, as you know, by a group of experts. And I think this muffled concept was quickly taken up by many of our community as the community appreciated um, the inclusion of positive criteria for a diagnosis. But however, based on the existing data, it's clear that muffled is not the same as muffled and changing the definitions, for example, in terms of the amount of alcohol intake, 
consumed may have serious consequences for clinical trial development programs, but also biomarker research. And third, as also mentioned by Laurie, the nomenclature consensus conference is not just about finding a name, but rather an evidence-based approach that helps to adequately define this global health threat to improve the development of drugs, biomarkers, as these may vary according to the different etiopathogenicities. And I just want to refer here only to the obese NEFLD and lean NEFLD. So in keeping with this importance, I think this is the largest global consensus initiative ever undertaken in hepatology. So we are all very proud of being part of it, looking forward to the outcome, and over to you. Thank you. I'm Graciela Castro. I'm the president of the Latin American Association for the Study of the Liver. Dear Dr. Lordi Liv, president of the American Association for the Study of the Liver Disease. Dear uh, Dr. Thomas Berg, general secretary of the European Association for the Study of the Liver. Dr. Mari Rinella and Dr. Phil Nisum, Nomenclature Steering Committee co-chair. Dr. Jeff Lazarus, Consultant Nomenclature Steering Committee. Distinguished members of NAFLD Nomenclature Steering Committee and all those present at this meeting. It is an honor for me to represent the Latin American Association for the Study of the Liver in this historic and relevant consensus process which represent scientific rigor, transparency, inclusion, knowledge, sum on efforts and wills. If each and every one of the participants at a global level who contribute in a multidisciplinary way among scientists, researchers, academics with great knowledge, trajectory, and publication on the subjects. In addition to patient and industry, always thinking of the benefits of patient and the scientific community in a friendly way, seeking to eliminate stigma and foreign well-being with the necessary criteria. Justify or not a change of nomenclature with discussions and agreement always within good practices. On behalf of the Latin American Association for the Study of the Liver and the countries that comprise it, I deeply appreciate having participated in this enriching process. The guarantees that the result obtained will always be the best. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce Jeff Lazarus. Jeff is an expert on infectious disease policy and health systems on the faculty of the Barcelona Institute for Global Health and on the faculty of the University of Bar Barcelona. Dr. Lazarus is a PI on the European Commission's Joint Action on Infectious Diseases, chair of the Lancet, Lancet HIV 490 Commission, and a commissioner of the Easel Lancet European Liver Commission. He is an editorial board member of the International Journal of Drug Policy, HIV Medicine, and the Journal of Hepatology. In 2017, he was awarded the Economist Intelligent Unit, Intelligence Unit Hepatitis C Changemaker Award. Earlier, he worked for 11 years at WHO Europe and three at the Global Fund, at the Global Fund and was board chair of AFEW International and co-founding director of Health Systems Global. Jeff? Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us at this session. I'm going to say a few words about the NAFLD nomenclature processes methodology, what we call a Delphi methodology. So I think it's important that we understand what we're talking about when we refer to the specific methodology. I'll give some recent examples that some of you were involved in related to NAFLD and another example recently published related to COVID-19. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about applying Delphi to the NAFLD nomencl nomenclature question specifically. So when we're talking about the sample 
in this kind of study, we're talking about the panel. The goal is not representativeness. The Delphi is based on selecting, you know, often a homogenous group of experts and knowledge leaders in a particular field or topic. It allows for dissent, but the idea is not to um, have the kind of representativeness we're often familiar with in certain kinds of trials. So the study design is mixed methods. This is a quantitative design. We have survey questions. We've already gone through three rounds. And we have qualitative text responses. We then have an integrated analysis to inform the revision of questions and statements that feed into the next survey round. And as I'll show you, that means, in this case, a lot of questions and a lot of comments for the steering committee to be to address. In terms of the validity of the findings, all are valid. For example, we have an agreement continuum, <coughs> and we keep the rigor of the methodology in that way. So the first steps were the identification an invitation of a core group, and then a larger expert panel. We carried out a scoping review of the literature to inform discussions of draft statements. This is more than a simple change of a name. It's understanding the entire nomenclature related to fatty liver disease. We then had the preliminary drafting and revision of closed-end statements that was done usually by the core group based on literature review, discussions, and so on. Typically, a Delphi process will include two to four survey rounds. In our case, we've just finished the third round. We have real-time group and panel discussions. Statements are posed to the panel with quantitative and qualitative data collection, as I mentioned. <coughs> The quantitative was a four-point Likert measurement, agree, disagree, support, oppose, change, no change, and not qualified to respond as an option. Not everyone in a panel is necessarily able to respond to every statement or question, and that option is very important to understand um, the panel itself as we report the results and as we move further into the process. In terms of the qualitative feedback, this is open-ended feedback, suggested amendments, rationales for where there might be some disagreement. And finally, an iterative revision process incorporating open-ended question data to refine statements for subsequent rounds. Let me give you very quickly two examples. One was advancing a global public health agenda for NAFLD. The other was ending COVID-19 as a public health threat. Now, in terms of the NAFLD public health consensus statement, <coughs> you can see here in the figure, you know, we had 218 people from 98 countries and territories. And throughout 2021, we carried out three rounds of the Delphi. And you can see the numbers of statements change. It went from 38. Eventually, we reduced it to 37. After the first round of statements in that particular Delphi study, we set out to make recommendations, and we had a set of 26 recommendations. And in both cases, the statements and the recommendations, there were high degrees of agreement reported. This was about looking at fatty liver disease as a public health threat. So I don't think it's that surprising that there would be a high level of agreement. Some of the areas where a larger number reported not being qualified to respond was related, for example, to details around non-invasive tests and some other technical issues. And remember, that was a study that included patient advocacy group representatives and liver specialists, clinicians, researchers, and so on. <laughs> In terms of the concrete outcomes from that study, um, ultimately, we had seven key areas. The point here isn't to go into detail on that. It's just to show you the kind of outcome you can have from a Delphi study. Delphi studies can be small panels or larger panels. They can be a small number of statements and recommendations or a larger number of statements and recommendations. We just released um, a multinational consensus to end COVID-19 as a public health threat. 
Now is a probably a good time to acknowledge my co-methodologist, Professor Diana Romero at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. She couldn't join us here today, but she led this study with me in terms of the methodology. And there you see, you know, again, we started with a core group. We then expanded to representatives from 112 countries. Every country wasn't represented, but almost 400 people participated in that panel. We had three rounds and came up with a set of statements and a set of recommendations, in that case, specifically addressing COVID. Now back to the NAFLD nomenclature question, applying the Delphi process. I mean, the publication of both of those papers in Nature Family Journals shows that this is a rigorous methodology, albeit when we call it a consensus statement, sometimes people don't understand that there's a methodology behind that that needs to be followed in order for it to be accepted by our colleagues and accepted into the peer-reviewed journals. So we had our core group, the co-chairs, the working group members, and we had panel member composition, including representatives nominated from ASLD, ALE, Apostle, EASL, SASL, and patient diabetes groups, including ELPA, ALF, GLI, and LPI, and some other representatives um, invited as well. Organizations sent invitations to informed expert members of their societies, and in round one, we had over 200 respondents, in round two, 199, and in round three, which was a little shorter than normal to get ready for this meeting, there was 187, so in the end, we had a response rate of a little over 80% in each round, which is pretty good. The panel member demographics are collected, so we collect gender, the country one was born in, the country they work in, the primary sector of employment, the majority of time spent in, in which area of work, primary, or primary specialty expertise, um, was it clinical, for example, the years in the field post-training, the percentage of time spent in NAFLD-related clinical care and on research and articles authored. So different associations had different selection criteria, but we wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity themselves to decide who should be involved in this important process. In round one, we had three substantive uh, statement domains, the nomenclature and distinctions among disease elements, for example, diagnostic criteria, prognosis and treatment, there were 14 items, other factors possibly influencing consideration of additional or alternative terms, there were 14 items, and the name or term preferences, of which there were seven items, giving us a total of 35 statements. In round two, four substantive statement domains, so we added one, we had three in round one, nomenclature and distinction, I won't go through all the details, you can see the numbers, other factors possibly influencing consideration of additional or alternative terms, the name and term preference, um, and, a, and a set of pediatric focused statements. So what the Delphi does is round by round, it listens to the feedback, it listens to the voting, it takes account of the comments that are provided, and as you can see, the survey is not exactly the same each time. We're working to reach consensus, to reach a high level of agreement, but we also realize there will be some dissent, some disagreement, and we also need statements and recommendations that actually do something. They need to have teeth. We can't just all agree. So we needed um, to, to adjust in order to increase um, that agreement in round two. We moved to round three. <coughs> Seven substantive statement domains. Three were added. I'll read them quickly. Nomenclature, awareness, and stigma. Considerations regarding the term metabolic. Considerations regarding alcohol use. Disease definition and the role of steatohepatitis. Name and term preferences. Pediatric considerations. And nomenclature options in which we could rank preferences within two options. So now the survey starts to become a little more complicated and involves a ranking option there as well. So I see I'm running out of time, but let me just report. We had the primary sectors of employment, and many people have many different fields. So this was your primary um, field of employment, academic, public, private, other, and civil society, primary field or area of work, patient policy advocacy, um, or if I read it in reverse, the, the, the majority were involved in clinical research, just over a quarter. Their primary activity was as a healthcare provider, non-clinical research, and so on. 
the primary area of specialty of expertise, 170 reported back. Most people were involved in hepatology, also gastro and endocrinology. And some more details on the panel, demographics in terms of years worked in the field post-training, proportion of work in NAFLD-related clinical care. All of this to show you that a real effort was made to ensure geographic and gender diversity and diversity, additional diversity within um, the panel. This was not a homogenous group, and it was a group, again, that was selected by the participating associations, which were all of the leading associations um, in liver health care. <clears throat> in Chicago, many of you attended a one point, a one and a half day hybrid meeting where we were able to discuss the issues. We had short stage setting presentations. We had extensive breakout sessions and discussion opportunities in Chicago. And we had an emphasis on topics with varied response to distribution in the Delphi round one and in the Delphi round two. There was diverse organizational and geographic participation, over 100 people at the Chicago consensus meeting. That was held after round two and before round three. So where are we now? Round one, summing up you know, the panel demographics, the 35 draft statements, the open-ended questions. We moved to 55 revised new statements. Then we have the in-depth discussion. And in round three, we had 45 statements. So as we... I maybe should take off final and say at least results as of today. You know, we've been carrying out the data analysis and final, creating final statement categories. The starting point is the standard Delphi convention regarding agreement. The cut point is a supermajority of two thirds. This isn't a simple majority. We're talking about important issues where we want to show consensus, and that means having a supermajority of two thirds, and we report this as unanimous. Agreement, agreement, uh, category B, and then category C, a UABC system to report the levels of agreement within the supermajority um, category. It's confidential participation, it's de identified data analysis. So the team that's preparing this passes me the data and it's de identified um, at that point, which is extremely important, just like we do for blinded um, trials as well. Finally, the core group, you know, we'll start drafting the report, and I know our two co-chairs will talk more about the details, more about the next steps, but we'll be sharing with the panel more details, that some of which I've presented now, additional details for you to contemplate so we can have the final considerations and probably move into another round and hopefully make the final decision um, at that. So some of those next steps from our side in the method team is completing the round three data analysis. It was a mad dash to get everything ready for today, but it's coming along nice. We'll be synthesizing that also based on conference deliberations, drafting that final report to share um, with the larger panel. And actually, that was my last point. So let me end there in the interest of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for highlighting um, and giving us insight about the methodology. I think it's very much important to better understand what will be the outcome um, of this um, consensus nomenclature procedure. So I think it's now time to hear the patient voice. So it gives me a big pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. This is Donna Cryer and Robert Mitchell Thien, and both have been actively engaged and member of this Pan Society process as members of the steering committee. First, Donna Cryer is founder and president and CEO of the Global Liberal Institute, GLI, and Robert Mitchell Thien is the CEO of the PBC Foundation in the United Kingdom. So please, Donna. Thank you. I, I thank the uh, collective societies. I give uh, great thanks and appreciation to our two co-chairs, uh, Marinella and Phil Newsom, for how they have uh, included patients in meaningful ways from the beginning um, of this process. I did want to state that um, I am a patient, a patient advocate, as well as a leader of a patient advocacy organization. Um, and both the GLI uh, and the Nash Council, collectively, we bring together more than 200 organizations, including many patient uh, advocates and patient advocacy organizations within the Nash field. So if this goes forward. 
Excellent. I feel it's my obligation um, to be consistent in communicating the patient priorities in NASH. They are disease education awareness, people knowing about NASH. They are development and designation of simplified non-invasive testing and expanded screening. They are FDA approval, EMA approval of course, as well of, N of NASH drugs, devices, and diagnostics. And they are clinical environments organized to provide coordinated, integrated care to people at every stage of the NAFLD NASH spectrum. Not on that list is the name. That is not the top patient priority. For anyone who is uh, instigated in this process, feeling that uh, it must be done in the name of patients, you can put that aside. These are our priorities. I feel that is, it is the responsibility of those who are in leadership positions uh, in this field to anticipate and mitigate any impacts of a change in name or nomenclature. It is our responsibility to identify uh, any potential positive or negative impacts and implications um, and to uh, have solutions for them. Those include uh, collecting regulatory perspectives on the number and extent of revisions or the narrowing of label, anything that would delay drug development. Understanding uh, there would be significant investment needed to replace and redo patient education materials, websites, there has been a large investment by the patient community and that would need to be supplanted in uh, light of a change. Significant investment and awareness campaigns for each stakeholder group and the timing of any change if there were to be one um, before or after a NASH drug approval in the US for an opportunity to align a name change and publicity with a launch. It's only fair to do things in a coordinated uh, fashion in the context of the other elements of the field. So if we do change the name uh, and recognize all of the implications of that change, document them, uh, quantify them, and communicate them to the field, um, we should do this in a time-defined uh, change pathway with milestones. Um, some uh, learned participants in the steering committee have suggested that two to three years would be the timing for that process. That is not uncommon for a professional rebrand. I just give you uh, very quickly uh, examples from the Global Liver Institute NASH Action Plan, um, our 2022 scorecard, um, which is a product of our collective NASH Council members. It is by stakeholder groups, and the, the, the details, which are, are, are phenomenal in terms of, uh, of marking the many, many uh, advances that uh, stakeholders across this field have made on behalf of, of NASH. It's simply to point out how many different stakeholders and how many different places and elements a name change would implicate. So my recommendations are simply these. That we work closely with the FDA to clarify and limit any delays and limitations on the use of existing and near-term data. That we use the opportunity of nomenclature revision, should there be one, to meet all the criteria that our, our co-chairs will uh, explain and have been explained throughout this process. We'll use the opportunity of nomenclature revision, should there be one, to more clearly decouple uh, NASH from biopsy. A new or neutral name, um, consensus conference results will be, I think, further shared. Um, but slides that I did in anticipation um, of what, from the patient perspective, we would like to see, showed a strong preference um, throughout this consensus process for names um, that do reference fat in some form, but more follow uh, the classically uh, naming structure that we know in hepatology. Nomenclature schema that allows for disease subtypes and then graduations, and finally, an ish, uh, issue a time-defined change process and impact report. This is simply a reminder that we need to be good sports about things and play well together. What is important is that the field move forward together on behalf of the patients we all serve. Thank you. Yeah. So Donna, thank you so much. And now over to um, Robert Mitchell-Thien, as I mentioned, CEO of the PBC Foundation.
from the UK. Please, Robert. So, forgive my limp, if you will. Um, I'm suffering from a, a sore non-arm. Actually, no, it's a, a, a sore non-shoulder. So, so thank you for your patience. Um, Madam President, chairs, esteemed colleagues, it's an honor to stand here in front of you. I don't stand here as the CEO of the Foundation. I don't stand here as the chair of Liver Patients International. I don't even stand here as chair of Global Liver Institute Pediatric and Rare Liver Disease Council. I stand here as just one patient. So I'd like to, to make my disclosures, and my disclosures that I have no disclosure. Well, actually, when I say I have no disclosure, I, I have one disclosure to make. And my disclosure to make is that I'm a fat bastard. And I know I'm a fat bastard because I'm told regularly, online, offline, it's a thing. Now, it's not a thing for everyone. However, it's still a thing. This week, we had an article in the Times that told us that fat shaming is the only way to beat the obesity crisis. Stigma is a thing. Now, when it comes to how many people need to be stigmatized for it to matter. Let's say it's only 10%. That's only 10%. But when we consider that this condition affects more than a billion people, that 10% is over 100 million patients. Can I ask anyone in the room, please, if you wouldn't mind, just pop your hand up if you think it's okay that 100 million patients should be stigmatized. Let's say it's even 5%. That's only 50 million patients. Would that be okay? That tells us the time is now. Now, I stand before you one for one in name changes. Once upon a time, there was primary biliary cirrhosis. Now, guess what the issue was that? The major issue was patient stigma. And it became primary biliary cholangitis. And the sky didn't fall down. Industry partners who were about to go through the process of approval with the FDA, the EMA, were terrified about this name change. And yet, the name change was instrumental in changing the conversation. It took the entire arena of PBC forward. It's one of the most exciting and dynamic areas of hepatology today. And the name change and the conversations that came from that name change were absolutely part of that. So I propose to you that the time is now, and for multiple reasons, and one of them is that this is an enormous problem. Not the name, NAFLD, NASH. The disease itself, the effect on millions of people. We need right now not to be looking inward. We need to be facing the patients that we need to serve. So I'm asking you as a community to come together to get this done so we can get back on to focusing on some real words and some real work. And on that note, I want to thank the chairs, the esteemed colleagues, again, our amazing people that have led this process. Thank you so, so much for the, the way you've managed this. Um, and on that note, I finish with this. Again, a wiser mind than mine, but he says, if you think you're too small to make a difference, then try sleeping with a mosquito in the room. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much. So over to you, please. Thank you. The next topic is stigma, alcohol use, and drivers of disease by Mary Rinella. Uh, overview of results, part one. 
Dr. Mari Rinella is a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago Pritzel School of Medicine, where she is the director of the Metabolic and Fatty Liver Program. Currently, her focus is in clinical research in the area of no-alcoholic fatty liver disease and no-alcoholic steatohepatitis, both before and after liver transplantation. Thank you, Dr. Rinella. Gracias, and thank you to everybody. Um, so I will take you through the first half of the statements of the Delphi process that uh, Jeff Lazarus so uh, nicely presented. So just to re, uh, remind everybody what the key questions were that we were trying to address with this uh, survey. Um, they start with, uh, what, just, what are the current issues with our current nomenclature, NAFLD, and does any alternative name reconcile these issues? What's the importance of steatohepatitis and the definition of the disease and how we characterize it? How should the impact of alcohol be, be accounted for or not in the disease diagnosis? How do we address the impact of name change on disease awareness, clinical practice, design endpoints, and regulatory approval pathways? And lastly, and I would argue perhaps most importantly, how might a single name encompass a heterogeneity of what we consider currently to be NAFLD? Um, and how may we incorporate phen uh, phenotypes that de de develop over time into this uh, broader picture? So just, uh, I think Jeff alluded to this or, or mentioned this, but we did um, a, about two-thirds of the way through the process, we ex ex expanded the global representation um, and added additional respondents from the Asia Pacific region, uh, Latin America, and the Middle East and North Africa prior to the initiation of round three. So round three does include uh, all of those respondents. Uh, all of these respondents also completed round two so that we could consider their responses uh, in creating round three. The full cohort and comments were analyzed and re reviewed, as uh, Jeff mentioned, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the R3 statements are resulting from R2 plus the Chicago meetings discussions. The current cohort um, is, has been mentioned. It's actually 57 countries um, that are representing. Uh, these are the countries that are in the current consensus process that were invited and uh, participated. So just for a matter of framing, I'm just going to go through how we considered uh, consensus. And as Jeff mentioned, we a priori decided it would be 67% or supermajority. This is not a process that's going to uh, likely get on all of the topics high, high levels of agreement, um, as was uh, uh, garnered through the um, some of the, st the studies that Jeff mentioned because of the complexity and the um, controversial nature of some of these. So uh, consensus was defined as 67%, and then, of course, strong consensus uh, greater than uh, 80%. So first, starting with stigma, uh, of course, stigma, it's, it's very difficult to assess stigma uh, because it depends on who you ask. But, uh, but to Robert's point, really having stigma at all uh, that affects a large portion of patients is, is really to be avoided if possible. In this particular survey, 61% uh, of the respondents thought that non-alcoholic was stigmatizing, and 66% felt that uh, fatty was stigmatizing. 62% felt that non-alcohol related was perhaps less stigmatizing than non-alcoholic, and for pediatric and adolescent uh, patients or parents, that the term fatty in a name may be stigmatizing, and 55% of uh, respondents believed that. So as far as the role of alcohol, this is where we have the highest agreement. 95% uh, felt that 30 to 60 grams a day of alcohol alters the natural history of the disease. And the reason why this is important is because the current definition allows less than that. Um, a, and, and beyond that, it's no longer considered NAFLD. 90% um, uh, felt that 30 to 60 grams may alter response to therapeutics. Again, important in the sense that we are currently uh, on the cusp of having therapeutic 
uh, options for this disease. We are at late stages of biomarker development, and this may potentially uh, compromise that if we were to allow uh, increased alcohol intake uh, in these patients. And just for reference, the numbers in the parentheses are agree, or strongly or agree, and somewhat agree, just so for uh, framing. 83% um, fell to 30 to 60 grams a day in combination with metabolic risk factors should be categorized as an independent category. So again, I think this is important. This is a cohort of patients that we don't normally study, but it really is a real world cohort of patients. Um, and so this highlighted, I think, the importance and the opportunity actually of, of looking at this uh, cohort independently. 86% uh, felt that greater than 60 grams a day with metabolic risk factors should be termed alcohol-related liver disease with metabolic dysfunction. However, 82 percent uh, felt that irrespective of the presence of metabolic risk factors, it should be alcohol-related liver disease alone. With respect to the role of steatohepatitis, 95 percent felt that the distinction between steatosis and steatohepatitis has prognostic implications. The reason why this is relevant is because we think of fibrosis as being the only thing that determines outcomes, and this is true. However, the collinearity between steatohepatitis and fibrosis makes it very difficult to discern those out, and we have a strong, we believe as a community that steatohepatitis drives the development of fibrosis. 93% felt that in the current landscape, NASH resolution should remain an important classifier of disease activity. This is one of the endpoints uh, for uh, FDA uh, and EMA uh, approval. Uh, and we did ask several questions about histological scoring. Um, this is not something that we were expecting to get any significant answers from. It was more to read the temperature uh, of, of, the, of the respondents. We did not receive consensus on, on those. With respect to disease characterizations, 91% felt that hepatic steatosis caused by specific entities should be characterized as such. And what we mean by that are the more specific causes of steatosis like hypobeta lipoproteinemia, Wilson disease, uh, et cetera. 81% felt that those with steatosis without uh, metabolic risk factors is also an important category and should be characterized separately. 87 86% excuse me, felt that metabolic dysfunction highlights a central aspect of disease pathophysiology. And then only 56% thought that metabolic dysfunction was a clearly defined clinical entity. So um, I'd like to ask the panel members to come up, if that's possible, so that we can uh, sort of start the discussion. And our moderator, I believe, is Dr. Kanwa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fasiha Kanwa. I am at Baylor College of Medicine, and my task here is to just help us think through the data that have been presented thus far, along with uh, a great panel here of experts. Um, Dr. Silva Sukhyun is uh, at National Scientific and Technical Research Council, uh, Center for Advanced Studies in Human and Health Sciences. Inter-America Open University from Argentina. Uh, Dr. Singh is uh, at Kalinga Gastroenterology Foundation from India. Dr. Vlad Ratsu, um, I don't know if I want to take liberty of sp spelling or speaking, saying the name of the hospital, sort of. but uh, I could say France, yeah. uh, Paris. So the name of the hospital is even harder to pronounce than my own name, so. <laughs> so that, that I, I tried, <laughs> I can give it a try. But maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> I've been practicing, but I don't have enough trust and faith in my French. 
Um, but Dr. Vincent Wong, um, Chinese University of Hong Kong, Department of Medicine and Therapeutics uh, from Hong Kong. So, so great, uh, it would take me the whole 20 minutes to go over the expertise and experience of this panel, but uh, suffice it to say that they really are thought leaders in the field and have contributed substantially um, to the disease pathophysiology, uh, therapeutics, uh, clinical outcomes, et cetera. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'll just get us started, but really I think this is the purpose of this um, panel is to really hear from you, um, to see, really see what your thoughts are, your questions, your comments about the data that have been presented. It's been a long process, uh, but really this is uh, a bi-directional exchange and we really uh, welcome uh, you to come up. Uh, there are many microphones here, so please uh, come up and ask questions uh, as you think about them. But as you're thinking about them, I can get us started. Uh, so maybe I can start from Dr. Wang. Um, so, so Vincent, um, we live in a divided world, uh, but, but, but there, there was a high level of consensus on several items and questions. So I'm going to start with the very first ones that were presented around alcohol use. Um, so so are, what are your thoughts on uh, the agreement that we saw in trying to parse out alcohol use? It's the same condition, different conditions. For example, I can give some examples to get us started. Uh, moderate use, 30 to 60. Um, the, the survey respondents felt that it's uh, perhaps a dis distinct condition um, for patients who also have metabolic risk factors. Um, a, were you surprised to see that level of consensus? And, and B, what are your thoughts? Okay, so first of all, I'm not too surprised. And let me uh, talk about my thoughts first. So um, when uh, I joined the expert panel in proposing the term uh, method, so one of the key discussions is that uh, we don't want it to be a diagnosis of exclusion. So for a, diagnose, for a condition that affects 30% of the general population, it does not make sense to teach our uh, medical students or communicate with our patients that we are just trying to exclude other diseases. So, and on, at the same time, uh, it would also uh, trivialize the condition. So think about it. If you are interested in PBC, and, uh, and at the same time, the patient has PBC, and you find out that the patient also has hepatitis C infection, you wouldn't say that because there is HCV infection, and therefore we exclude the diagnosis of PBC. So likewise, in the field of fatty liver disease, it is increasingly recognized that although when we do research, we may want to exclude other etiologies, but in the real world, uh, things are not like that. So people can have a lot of metabolic disorders, they may drink quite a bit, they may even have viral hepatitis at the same time. And if we keep the original uh, mentality, then we would say that because our definition is to exclude other diseases, and therefore this patient does not have fatty liver or nephod. So uh, I think uh, we should recognize the contribution of that. Okay, now uh, regarding the uh, interaction between alcohol and metabolic risk factors, now the debate is still going on whether this is synergistic effect, additive effect, or whatever, but it is very clear already that uh, both etiologies, when coming together, would impact on the disease severity and also the rate of disease progression. So uh, these uh, all should be uh, recognized. So um, I think the consensus on the uh, amount of alcohol consum consumption, so moderate alcohol consumption on the uh, disease progression. So uh, I think uh, there have already been a number of studies uh, supporting that. So uh, I'm not too surprised indeed. So it is not only in the field of fatty liver disease. In fact, if a patient has other prone liver disease like viral hepatitis, and at the same time there's moderate alcohol consumption, that would also change the uh, trajectory of the natural history. So I think uh, I'm quite happy to see the consensus on this point, and uh, we can move forward uh, from there. Dr. Rasu, do you have any thoughts on this? On this issue about alcohol use, yes and um, people who have metabolic risk factors and also drink moderately or even excessively. Uh, is that a separate subgroup? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat what Vincent said. So I think there is an epidemiological reality that a lot of patients that have metabolic risk factors and thus fatty liver also drink alcohol in moderate amounts. Those people were uh, excluded from most of the studies that we have conducted so far. 
and you can't you can't really continue doing that because they because of the sheer number of this population so they need a special uh, uh, classification on their own or a special category to be recognized and to be labeled with um, but there's also uh, um, another side of the story which is that people who drink excessive amounts of alcohol uh, way beyond the, the dangerous limit that have clearly alcoholic liver disease no matter what can also have metabolic risk factors because of the epidemiological association and because it's very common and we know from many studies that th their risk of progression is not the same for the same quantity of alcohol they consume as those that do not have metabolic risk factors. So we also need to create a category or at, le or at least recognize through a name uh, the association of excessive alcohol consumption with metabolic risk factors. Uh, and and in, in some maybe more remote future, uh, do, uh, perform trials in these patients as well. So uh, in a nutshell, I, I, this is one of the rare examples of the, where the uh, the, the, the wisdom of the crowd uh, uh, prevailed in the sense that the, the, the democratic process came up with a really wise uh, result. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, to the other two panelists, do you think that um, these findings resonate with people around the globe? Uh, the, you know, issues about alcohol, how much is excessive alcohol, all of that is sort of drained somehow in the cultural norms and where people are living. So, so any, any thoughts on how important this conversation okay. is for, okay. for everyone in the world? Okay. Uh, I represent the population of South Asian countries. Now, in South Asian countries, the situation is different from the rest. We have a very, very high prevalence of NAFL without alcohol coming into the picture. In Afghanistan, people, alcoholic liver disease is almost not there. In India, alcohol is considered still a taboo. Most of the patients, when, they, when you ask them that you take alcohol, they get upset. They are not happy with it. And they have been extremely happy with the nomenclature precisely because that Contrary to what uh, has been spoken till now, that destigmatizes them. In the sense, once they get the diagnosis of NAFL, they thought that, okay, in future, when they go from one doctor to another, they are not asked about alcohol intake. They are very happy about it. So we'd actually done a survey where 87% of the NAFL population, we did it in five countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. 87% felt that they were, that NAFL, they were happy with NAFL because it destigmatizes them. So I think basically we have a, the problem of stigma is different from what we have been understanding about stigma. I sometimes feel that we as physician uh, stigmatize the patient. The way we present things to the patient, if we are having a questionnaire, if, if we are doing a survey, the way we ask, do you like the word alcoholic in this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? He feels upset. He doesn't want alcoholic. But if you say non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, where non-alcoholic implies that you don't take significant alcohol, he's happy. So that makes all the difference. Thank you, thank you. Um, just to make sure that we um, stay on time, I'm going to move to another question, uh, Silva, for, for you. Um, I, I mentioned high level of consensus. There seems to be a reasonably high level of consensus on metabolic dysfunction being one of the drive, being a key driver for the condition. But at the same time, we also saw almost like a flip of a coin, 50-50% agreement on uh, the fact that we can define that dysfunction well. W what do you think? Well, thank you. This is a the tough question came to me. I appreciate that. But <laughs> I still like you very much. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, we heard a lot about the word metabolic. Um, I think from the 
doctor size and the scientific size, um, the academic size, metabolic um, represent in a way what is metabolic syndrome. This is the first uh, condition that came in my mind because it's, uh, all the time we are repeating fatty liver or nuffle or cetosis is the hepatic manifestation of a metabolic syndrome. I think that this is the, the main reason for why uh, the muffled terminology was, in a way, introduced in some part of the uh, literature in the last uh, couple of years. But I also acknowledge that um, there are some concerns about the word metabolic, because I heard yesterday a, a good point from Manal telling us that uh, some people could associate metabolic with inherited metabolic diseases, it, which is tricky because this is only in the mind of the doctors because patients uh, usually don't associate uh, inherited disease with this terminology. See, so I think we need to reconcile uh, which is knowledge about uh, what we know about the factors that drive the disease, which are certainly metabolic factors, and which is the, the word metabolic in a nomenclature. Yes. Yes. Can I add something here? I think it's very important that um, we recognize that one aspect of the virtue of a name is the ability to convey it easily to patients to explain easily to a patient what it is about, his disease is about. And I find it very simple to say, because everybody agrees that you know obesity and overweight and, and diabetes and all these metabolic factors are, are strongly associated with NASH. Even if it's hard scientifically and you can, you can refine the concept and not agree with metabolic dysfunction or find that there are some other issues to the metabolic appellation, it, fundamentally, by and large, it is what characterizes this disease, and it is a very simple way to explain it to the patient. I don't find any other simpler way to say it. So people usually ask you, you tell them they have cirrhosis, they say, I don't drink, how can I get cirrhosis? And then you go on saying, well, you know, there are different types of cirrhosis, not only alcohol. There's viral cirrhosis, there's genetic cirrhosis, there's autoimmune cirrhosis, there's metabolic cirrhosis. And people don't understand. So this aspect, although it might not fit of the best scientific uh, identification of the term, and uh, it, it, is, it has the virtue at least of being easily uh, explainable to the patient. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wong, um, so it makes a lot of sense what we heard from Vlad, um, but as we think about trials and biomarker studies where a certain level of specification is necessary to define a patient population. Can you then expand on this notion about defining um, these criteria to be able to identify patients in an objective and reliable manner? And I'm going talking about metabolic dysfunction. Edit. The, you can use a term in, in a sort of a wider sense with a, some sort of level of approximation, linguistic approximation or scientific approximation. But then when you do a protocol, you write a protocol, be it for a therapeutic trial or for natural history study, you have the liberty to define very precisely the selection criteria in the way you best see fit. So I don't see any conflict. You can call the disease with an umbrella term, whatever term you choose, which approximates the, 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 the scientific relevance or the, of the term, and then when you do a trial, it's a totally different story. You have to be very precise on what type of patients you want to put in the trial. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Okay, I thought uh, I'll add um, on. Um, I, I want to check in literature. I googled up. Uh, is there any available evidence on stigma in the general population amongst patients, not in the scientific? Uh, I didn't find any. Then I found this book. This is an American publication. And this is published by an American hepatologist from Texas, Rita. Junior has fatty liver. And nowhere in the reviews which I found on the book or anywhere, there was anyone was happy, unhappy. No one was unhappy. That's interesting. So, 
I thought I should uh, <laughs> bring this out. Great, thank you. Um, yes. No, I, I, oh, sorry, I, I, I appreciate that. But, but the, I think that if it's possible to avoid stigma, I think that we should strive to do that because it, I don't think we can really decide how much is okay or not okay. That's not really our call. So I, I do feel like if we can, we should strive to not have that, if we can do that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong, I know you have a comment. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say that I agree with uh, Vlad. So um, the definition of a disease is somewhat different from the inclusion and exclusion criteria of clinical studies. So for example, nowadays when we are conducting clinical trials for NASH, okay, so or, although in the original definition of NASH, we do not have any of the metabolic criteria, but when you read the clinical trial protocol, it is not uncommon that uh, some protocols may require diabetic patients, some protocols may require a BMI of more than 25. So, so this is how you define the population so that uh, uh, your clinical trial would represent something. Now, for the same reason, uh, although we uh, embrace that people can have dual etiology, but in clinical trials or when you develop biomarkers, we have to recognize that these confounding etiologies would also affect how you interpret the results and also the treatment effect. And therefore, it is right that we have to exclude the other diseases uh, in those contexts. But it does not mean that uh, we cannot define a disease that way. It is just uh, scientifically, we need to know what we are doing. Great, great. Um, just before I wrap up, uh, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, take advantage of my authority as the chair um, of this panel right now to call upon Dr. Ken Kusi that I think is sitting right there uh, as an endocrinologist, diabetologist, um, if he can speak a few words or his thoughts about this exact issue we're discussing right now about def defining metabolic dysfunction. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to take too much time because we've, we've discussed this many times. I recognize what Vlad says, that if patients find this easy to communicate, I mean, that in the end we're doing things for patients. Just want to share that uh, for if you, uh, in, the, in, in the diabetes and endocrine world, metabolic, everything is metabolic. So, so it, and again, there were raving discussions for 10 years over insulin resistance definitions, metabolic syndrome definitions and it kind of died off out of fatigue, I think. Um, so my, my greatest concern was, was not that what cutoffs you would take, we could take what was used in the past, but that there be now uh, 100 papers comparing MAFLD to NAFLD and would be more than anything a distraction at a time when, that, this is my personal greatest argument, uh, that it could be a distraction, but I think that every, anybody, anyway, we have to move beyond NAFLD, and uh, if the majority thinks that it's the best term, well, I think that we just shouldn't get too cut off uh, with the term and, and just concentrate on moving forward. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Rohit. Oh, yes, please go ahead. I didn't see that, please. I'm, I'm not sure you're allowing public comments. If you are, just a, yeah, a quick comment from a pediatrician. When you do look for metabolic liver disease, as pediatricians, we have been used to using that term. And if you do Google it, people have been Googling today, the first things that will come up are alpha-1 antitrypsin and Wilson's disease, because that's what we have been, the patients will see on the front end as well. Great, thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Very, can, yes, please. Can I, oh. Go ahead. Oh, right. No, right over. Um, so I have some historical uh, background because uh, the term NASH was coined at Mayo by Jurgen Ludwig, and I think I'm oldest member of Mayo Crowd May here. Um, when he described the first condition, condition uh, and reported to the journals, reputable people laughed at him saying, you guys took the history wrong, the patient has been drinking. No one believed that there was an entity called NASH. Hard to believe today, but that's uh, what it was. And it was until a, a, a case of, of temperance society, which is a non-drinker society, society president, 
got diagnosed with this condition and was given a diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis, that it became a big deal, that this came, came about, it clarifies this person is clearly non-drinker, but still has this condition. That's how the term came, came up, NASH. So I'm, I'm agreeing with SP that it is for patients who are, are committed non-drinking as a stigma to, 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 to drink alcohol. It is a clarifying term. That's the origin of the term. I just wanted to give you a historical background. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. Is it time for a short comment or, or no? Yes. Very short. Very short. Um, <laughs> One important aspect, everybody's complaining that we're not recognizing the heterogeneity of this disease. Uh, I find the results that you've presented very interesting because by creating a category where the steatotic liver disease is associated with metabolic risk factors, I think it's a step forward in creating more homogeneous groups of patients. Because right now, when you call someone as having NAFLD, that person can have very mild overweight or no overweight at all, no diabetes at all, have steatosis for reasons that are not very clear. Uh, it, and it, next to him can sit the typical patient with overweight diabetes and steatosis. So that does not increase homogeneity. Uh, but the, the results you have shown points to a, a process that might end up creating a category much better defined clinically and phenotypically by the fact that the patient has these uh, metabolic risk factors, and when he doesn't, it's diatosis of other origin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looks like we have one more comment. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd also comment. Just a, yeah, Brent Tetry, St. Louis, just a very quick comment. One thing I've learned through this whole discussion process is making a distinction between the name and sort of the definition. And if we keep the name really simple, it's good for billing and coding and all that, which is great. And if we try to pull into the, into the name, the definition, and all the components of it, that will be very fluid over time. And we're gonna have to change it as our understanding improves. <clears throat> so I would encourage us to find a name that's very short, non-stigmatizing, and then over time, we can ch keep changing the definition uh, the components of it, but we don't have to change the name that we use for all that. This is, I think, a great comment. Thank you, because it's really a good segue for the next session. Um, and over to you, uh, Mary. But thank you um, for listening, and thanks to all the panelists for joining us. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to call um, Phil Newsom up, who will talk through us through the second uh, part of the data. I would now like to introduce Philip Newsom. He is professor of hepatology at the University of Birmingham and runs the NAFLD clinical service there. He is director of research and knowledge transfer for the College of Medical and Dental Sciences, director of the Center for Liver and Gastrointestinal Research, and director of the NIHR Birmingham Biomedical Research Center. He recently served as ESL Secretary General from 2019 through 2021. He has published over 150 major research papers in scientific journals, as well as reviews and book chapters. Dr. Newsom. Thank you very much, Laurie. So um, I'm going to talk through the, um, the second part of the data set. Um, so there's sort of several domains here. One is around um, a question whether people feel we should change the name, whether we should change the definition. And then walking through, you know, how people perceive that will impact on awareness, how it will impact on uh, trials, biomarkers, and then really get to the, the nitty gritty when we talk about some of the, the name options. So hopefully I, I, won't, I won't do a Warren Beatty on that. So um, the same sort of scoring profile that uh, Maru illustrated earlier. So here's a question which is saying, you know, do people feel that the current nomenclature, so NAFLD and NASH, are sufficiently flawed 
to warrant consideration of a name change. And you'll see there the, the four categories that uh, Jeff alluded to. So if you add up the agree and somewhat agree, so it's 74% felt that the current name um, was sufficiently flawed to warrant a name change. That passed the supermajority. Um, what about the question of a definition? Um, and this was a topic of much discussion at the meeting in Chicago. And there you can see that it was 66% felt um, that it did warrant a change in definition and 34% didn't. And I think one of the things we need to reflect on when we come to the discussion panel is, you know, we think about a definition change as being a binary, but of course, you know, within a change of a definition, it depends just how much you change the definition and, and Vlad sort of touched on that. So I think that's something we should discuss and we'll follow up in the next round. Um, I mean, n I don't think anybody wants to push the field backwards here in terms of awareness, in terms of availability of biomarkers or drugs. So that, you know, there's an, un you know, a, a, an understandable concern that could a name change have an impact on disease awareness. And you heard Robert talk um, around the effect in, in primary biliary cholangitis. So um, what you can see here is that 73% felt that actually a name change could improve awareness or have no effect, with 27% having uh, a view that it would worsen or significantly worsen awareness. Um, in terms of the impact of a change in both name and definition, um, people felt this could have an effect on interpreting previous clinical trial results. 60% um, felt it would hinder it, 21% would have no impact. I think if this comes down to, again, you know, what a change in definition looks like. In the, you know, clearly, a, a minor change in the, the types of patients we're talking about you know, would obviously have a very different effect to a major change. Um, however, if you change the name only, people really didn't feel that would have an impact on the interpretation of previous clinical trial data. So you can see there, 82% felt it would have either no impact or actually enhance um, the interpretation. Um, same story really for biomarkers, and this was something that was discussed you know, reasonably um, extensively at the meeting in Chicago. You'll see here that people felt that if you change the definition, um, you know, that, that would have an impact. So 59% felt it would have a delay. Um, so again, that's something we can discuss um, with the panel. Um, whereas if you change the name only, really no impact. So I think, you know, there's a consistent trend there. So changing the name doesn't seem to have an impact, but changing in the definition may do, um, depending on how that's done. So um, one of the questions was around how we think about the overall structure. Um, the question that was posed was, would people prefer to have an umbrella term that describes the presence of fat inside the liver, and below that you would have the different types um, of conditions, you know, which could be NAFLD as we know it now, it could be related to alcohol, it could be due to drugs, etc. Or do you just go straight to the one in blue um, where you just have you know, the specific conditions? Um, so the answer was very clear, so 78% of respondents you know, wanted an umbrella term. Uh, so, you know, an individual has got, you know, fat inside the liver, steatosis in the liver, whatever else, and then you'd go on to a second level um, set of terms. So, these were the data really trying to pick what that name should be for the overarching term. Um, and you can see here um, the way it was ranked, you had to rank your first choice and which one you wanted second and which one you wanted third. Um, you'll see here that the the choice with the highest number of first choices was steatotic liver disease, which was ranked by 48%. Um, then fatty liver disease um, was the next highest choice at 46%. We then went on to look at the combination of first and second choices, and you'll see there that steatotic liver disease um, was the highest one with 95%, 72% for fatty liver disease, and 34 for lipogenic or lipotoxic. So, the other sort of considerations that we had in terms of thinking about um, the different types was, you know, whether we should use a type one, type two, type three, type four type of nomenclature, or a sort of primary and secondary. Um, you can see for both of these, you know, there was a sort of almost a 50-50 view as to whether people like that type of nomenclature. So we'll try and pick that up in, in the next round. Um, so this is a, a busy one, but there were quite a few options here. And I think one of the challenges in this round was trying to to keep as many options available to individuals, um, but it, it did make it rather complicated. I think the take-home message there is that you see that the highest 
the term that had the highest number of first choices was the one that included metabolic in some way or form in the title. And we put us, we, you know, so we specifically put a couple of options in there so that people, you know, it could capture the, the different options that use metabolic. So that was 35%. Um, and then you can see things like fatty liver, steatonic liver disease, or type one or primary. There were some, some ones which, which obviously had a very low level of choice. So from the top, lipogenic, lipotoxic, um, non-alcoholic was, was poor at 9%, nutrition associated 5%, and visceral at 2%. So we then tried to, to uh, look at, you know, if you combine the first and second choices, and again, the one that comes out top there is one that includes the word metabolic in some way or form, just under half the respondents, 48%, and then you've got um, steatotic and fatty liver, 42 and 39, which you know, I think recognized in retrospect, it became complicated when you were trying to pick an overarching term and a, and a second level term when there was some um, duplication. But we can talk through you know, how we might um, move this element forward. Um, so pediatrics, um, recognizing that um, there are challenges there in terms of how the current nomenclature functions, but also how a new one might function. Um, so the question here was, you know, was the current definition NASH less useful in children? Um, you know, because some, some of the peculiarities around how um, the condition is identified, you can see there the very clear view, 95% felt that it was not particularly useful or less useful. Um, and then the comment that just came up in the, um, from the podium, uh, from the, um, the microphone, um, the recognition that metabolic in children does pose some additional dimensions because of the inherited metabolic diseases. So again, that's something that, you know, we want to make sure that we do this in a way that really captures the breadth of, of patients in medicine. Um, but there you can see 90% felt it could be potentially confusing because of um, the reference or the, the, you know, the reference to inborn errors of metabolism. So um, I'd like to ask the, the panel members to join, um, join us on the front, including um, Robert and Donna, please. And I guess some of the questions which I think it would be useful to, to reflect on in this, in this component is um, the votes that you've seen on the name, the votes you've seen on the definition, and then the, you know, the, we discussed this at the steering committee yesterday, you know, the results apropos the overarching term, the choice for steatosis, and then thinking about how we approach um, the next level of questions for what should be the term that we use to describe what we currently know as NAFLD, really, and also then picking up this notion of, you know, is a definition binary, or can we think about definition in a grayscale way? In other words, a definition which is a subtle change rather than a marked change. So if you could please all join the panel now, and we can have the, the discussion. Thank you. Okay, now it seems to work. So we expanded a little bit the panel. Uh, my name is Sven Frank from the University Hospital in Antwerp. I'm just going to briefly introduce the other panelists. Some of them you have already seen, like Phil and Donna. We have Marco Arese from Chile, Manal Abdelmalek from the US, from uh, the Mayo Clinic, Arun Sanyao also from the US, Virginia Commonwealth. I'm looking to, yeah, we have Robert then, and then we have uh, Jeffrey Strimmer, who is a, a pediatrician, so uh, very welcome here on the panel, very uh, important contribution, I think, also from the US, and then Shiv Sarin from India. Thank you. So, um, as Phil has already pointed out, we have several 
things to, to discuss, but I want to take first of all advantage of the fact that we have a pediatrician amongst us. We already discussed uh, in the previous session. Uh, but Jeff, can we have your take on, on the pediatric issues that uh, also Phil has presented? It's uh, both on the name, but also what, uh, Phil, I think you didn't show it, but also the issue on s of steatohepatitis, which is probably different in children and adolescents compared to adults. So I think uh, there are a few questions, thank you. Um, with respect to the term metabolic, um, as Dr. Coley pointed out, uh, certainly among pediatricians, we're typically thinking about that word as, as meaning inborn errors of metabolism, or uh, it's coming up in the terms of something like hypermetabolic, like why is our patient not gr growing well? Um, and so I think it does, you know, we're not typically thinking about it across pediatrics in general as insulin resistance, diabetes, dyslipidemia, like it is in adult medicine. Um, in terms of steatohepatitis, we do appreciate that it is different than having steatosis alone. The confusion is that there is maybe more than one type of steatohepatitis, specifically in prepubertal children, one can often have quite a bit of inflammation and fibrosis in the absence of ballooning at all. And so I think, um, you know, how to classify steatohepatitis in children is an ongoing issue. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think also the, the, the different options that Phil has shown in terms of having a replacement term for an FLD, of course, the aspect of metabolism, metabolic, seems to be important, but there is no supermajority there. I would like to hear from some of the panelists how they think we should now move forward with, with this issue. Marco, perhaps you can. Thank you. Uh, I would like first to thank Saleh for, for uh, allowing me to participate in this important process, uh, working with the people in the NAFL interest group in the LA with uh, Claudia Oliveira and Adrian Gadano. We are happy to, to give our opinion. Um, I think that uh, we have to move forward trying to, to follow what the high-level consensus uh, uh, dictated, dictated in the conference in July from uh, the features that were listed in that moment. The, the one I think for, for this panel is more important in ten research wise is to get a, a, a new nomenclature that is uh, adaptable in terms of the existing knowledge. So uh, the, 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 when we discuss about uh, changing the name and definition, we will try to find a way to keep the definition of NAFL in, in some category in order to keep all the knowledge. And probably the most important uh, overlapping condition is alcohol. And in that regard, probably we have to come up with a, a, a threshold of alcohol that contributes to NAFL, but is not alcoholic liver disease, and that was mentioned in the, in the panel before. So I think that we are moving to probably to have an overarching term and type one, what is was formerly known as NAFL, and then have a dual with alcohol and other things, and then complex uh, etiologies, I think. But uh, we have to move forward uh, with the four round probably in to, to get into there. Um, thank you. Rob, Robert, you wanted to comment on it? Please, if I may. So thank you. Um, again, coming at what is a public health issue from a rare perspective, if I may, we're charged first and foremost to do no harm. And one of the issues with metabolic is the, the relationship with, with pediatrics. But also, when you consider parents whose children have one of these conditions, and they're going to go to Dr. Google, and they're going to look up metabolic, mm -hmm. is Google going to produce this rare little disease that affects a few children in the world? Or is it going to Google and throw up this enormous behemoth of a condition that affects over a billion people? And so actually using the term metabolic is going to make it more difficult for rare disease patients and rare disease patient parents to find the information they need about the condition that they're facing. Thank you. Shif, can you share your vision on this? Well, thank you uh, for the SLD for inviting me. I have, I'll give a simile with alcohol. When a patient comes with alcohol, we say abstinence we tell him how to improve. So he has a target, and here, if we do not use that kind of a target for either patient or for the doctor, 
it will not be easy for us to treat a disease if it is a disease. So first part is if alcohol, calling a person taking alcohol is not bad, I'm not too sure with all respect to you that if you do not include a target for the patient, whether we will improve. Mm. Part two is even in the consensus, it was metabolic dysfunction, rather a uh, more acceptable thing. I understand pediatric, but then you call it metabolic liver disease, not metabolic dysfunction with fatty liver disease. So here there is a slight change. Third, for the policy makers, uh, whenever we tell the policy maker NAFLD or fatty liver, they didn't even pay attention. But the moment it came metabolic, having a limb of diabetes, having a limb of obesity, it actually connected all non-communicable diseases. The national programs have included, at least in India, the fatty liver as part of the reduction strategies for NCDs. So the government's funding approaches improve with metabolic dysfunction. Patients' understanding, and Ken Cusey is here, diabetes and others includes. So if there is a need for a change, I think at least metabolic part or a fatty liver part should be part of it for understanding. And every patient or relatives understand, oh, I have a metabolic problem, I know I have a metabolic. So that is a way of explaining to the patient, and I think Vlad also said uh, almost similar things. Thank you. Donna, you wanted to comment also? Yes, thank you. So I would respectfully disagree with how to best advance with policymakers. Um, as the convener of International Nash Day um, and as a denizen of, of Washington, D.C. for more than 30 years, um, I certainly can't speak uh, as a physician expert, but as a lawyer and policymaker, I certainly can. We can make uh, progress with almost any name, but I would suggest that uh, causing confusion and uh, non-harmonization with um, any part of our own field, um, such as causing confusion uh, with our pediatric colleagues um, and our rare disease colleagues, as Robert pointed out and Dr. Coley pointed out, is not helpful. Our advance in uh, this condition really depends on our increasing partnership with uh, primary care with endocrinology. And so as one has explained by Dr. Cousy and I believe Dr. Sanyal and others have explained that uh, metabolic starts to be uh, not meaningful because it, it is so pervasive across so many different conditions. And so while I absolutely understand, and when I initially came to this, it's very natural to explain this condition by its connection to obesity and diabetes, and we must continue to do so having metabolic in the name is not necessary and in fact may ultimately, for the factors that we have raised and were emphasized by the vote most importantly, mm -hmm. so we can move forward, it's not helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Manal or Arun, any final comments on this issue? Um, I think one thing uh, that has come through clearly is that uh, the current, I think we've known this all along, that the word non-alcoholic is a non-term and thus suboptimal. Uh, however, the issue we're debating to, you know, over the course of the last year through this process has been, can we go from one suboptimal term to a truly optimal term? And how do we get there? And uh, replacing one set of issues with another set of issues is, uh, in my view, uh, still sub and a suboptimal solution to the problem. Now, I heard from a lot of people, particularly when we had the meeting in Chicago, that apparently everybody understands what metabolic liver disease actually is. So when I went back, I started asking the first question straight off the bat. When the, these are patients, follow-up patients with fatty liver disease that I'm seeing in my clinic. I want to ask you this question. In your mind, no prep, define metabolism to me. And from judges to lawyers to doctors, the doctors also, not one of them could clearly articulate what the word actually meant. It was all over the map. And this is anecdotal. 
but it gives me pause that I think we have to continue to think through this. And I would articulate that the issues of, uh, that I, I agree with Donna that, you know, uh, we have somehow to have a terminology that one, does not stigmatize, but also at the same time conveys that this condition can potentially be very serious. Because one of the challenges that I face, having been practicing hepatology for now 30 something years, is that in the hepatitis C days, every patient was incredibly aware of the seriousness of their problem. They wanted therapy at all costs. Many of my patients have somehow felt that this is a, I don't know, I'm here because my doctor told me to come to see you. I really don't want to be here. What's this problem? I'm not convinced. And somehow I think we also need to consider that. So I think those are just my additional points. As we go to the final round, uh, just some thoughts for consideration. Not that I have any particular position. I don't have a dog in this show. If I could make one other comment. Um, looking at NAFLD, and NASH, although I had earlier talked about the difficulty of NASH as a diagnosis in children, it's very useful when I'm talking to children and, and parents, both parts of that term. So the word hepatitis gets people's attention. I explain what it means, and they take it more seriously. Number one. Number two, the word alcohol, understanding that they Theirs is not related to that in this child that I'm seeing, but that the disease may have characteristics in terms of its seriousness, like what they, the parent already is aware of can happen with chronic alcohol use, also gains traction and attention. And so that may not be the best reason for a name, but I think it's something to, to consider. Now, um, as I... There's someone, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Jack. yeah, go ahead. Microphone number nine. Okay. If, yeah, I mean, I'll just briefly, while uh, we'll try to find the microphone that works. Yeah, so um, enjoying the conversation. Uh -huh. uh, what, there are other societies that have done things with disease states, and I again would be someone who would go against using the word metabolic, um, but I do like the steatosis discussion because it sort of destigmatizes things. But if it, I'm an insulin-dependent diabetic, had it since I'm 10, and most people, including doctors, will come up to me and I'll say I'm diabetic, and they say, are you type 2? After they've heard that I was 10 years old when I got it, right? So what they do is they, they're characterizing me it's something they would expect in an older diabetic. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is consider two things maybe in the way they label when you go to your ICD-10s and you drop down this list, it'll give diabetes plus these subsets. Mm -hmm. That'll be type two, type 1A, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. with or without complications. And maybe what we want to be talking about maybe here is steatotic liver disease mm -hmm. and then characterize subsets associated with it because one, you hold the description mm -hmm. and two, not every metabolic is the same as every metabolic. Yeah. And three, you've got a global heading and then you've got your subgroups tied to the principle. So my, uh, my thought about it would be more going that way than yeah, calling I, something metabolic river. I agree with this approach because we have to leave ourselves open enough that as we start to define this disease with more granularity, mm -hmm we will be able to appropriately phenotype or genotype various patients. And my challenge with the world, word metabolic is it can mean so many different things to so many different people in the context of use. And in and of itself, I mean, primary biliary cirrhosis was cirrhosis very early on because that's how people presented, very advanced. And when we had the advent of developing or having an anti-mitochondrial antibody, which came far later than the disease description arose, then we detected people earlier and we noted the cholangitis presence that preceded the cirrhosis. And as we evolve our biomarker panels and our genomic and proteomic and metabolomic profiles, we're going to find ourselves at a crossroads where this disease, again, may be yet more granularly 
subcategorized, and and is it, the presence of chronic liver disease. We saw it with Hep C. Patients with Hep C develop diabetes, and when you improve their Hep C, it got better. And likewise, we see lipid abnormalities with other cholestatic liver disease. So the the sequela of metabolic derangement, sir, is a, also a consequence, as it is a driver of injury. So and unless somebody can tell me what metabolic truly is and how it's defined, are we talking insulin resistance or are we talking global me metabolic alterations? I appreciate that the steatotic liver disease is broad enough that will allow us to, to subcategorize as we learn more about this disease and we understand hopefully our, our endocrinologist should, can shed light and develop the key lock that defines the syndrome um, and then we, we can move on with whatever that is. But it, this is a very challenging area because of the cause-effect relationships and the, where we currently are, which is still early in, in, in phenotyping and genotyping this condition. Yeah, and just to give feedback on we had of, or we have the option of type 1, type 2, and so on mm -hmm. in the survey, but it didn't reach uh, super majority far, far from that. But it was one of the options that was in the survey. Ken? Yeah. Um, w one aspect also that I talk with a lot of primary care doctors, mm -hmm. and when, you s when I discuss this, this metabolic syndrome, oh, it's just a metabolic syndrome. Oh, what's the big deal? So mm -hmm. yeah. there's a good chance that your primary care doctors will downgrade this, right. put it in a bag of steatosis, and not take it seriously. So if you get into this metabolic uh, definition, there are like six definitions of metabolic syndrome. We use we just use that the NCP one, which is practical. But but I'm really afraid of this just getting into the big bag of oh obesity, diabetes, and getting very difficult to get the message mm -hmm. that this is going to cause cirrhosis mm -hmm. and uh, and HCC. So. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that the comment made that there's a possibility that it might be better understandable, and I understand some policymakers might understand more metabolic. Uh, there's a good good chance that that it will lose all its impact by just saying, "Oh, it's metabolic. Okay, yeah. just yeah. lose some weight." So that, that's another another danger among all the aspects that we've discussed. And in reality, it's an insulin resistance associated liver disease, and, and maybe we should, be, it's one aspect, but it's a universal finding. Maybe we should begin thinking around um, something is a bit more, more specific. Thank you. Microphone number three. Yeah, when initially, um, and when I was back in practice, sometimes I'd get a report and the radiologist would say, there's a little bit of fat in the liver. Mm -hmm. And you call the radiologist and go, it's nothing to worry, just a little bit of fat. Mm -hmm. So when it went from fatty liver disease to NASH, that ended up being helpful as a practicing physician to be able to you know, discuss the severity or the, mm -hmm. um, the continuity of the disease mm -hmm. with patients or with primary care physicians. But this whole discussion really took me back to, um, in my life, in the infectious disease world, when we first, back in 81, the first patients who we would now call having AIDS, they were homosexual men with pneumocystis pneumonia, and then it was called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. But then we were seeing men who were bisexual, and we were seeing individuals who um, inject drugs, and then we were seeing the female partners of men who were bisexual. And it was very, very difficult. And so we had to sit down and say, you can't call it GRID. Mm -hmm. It's immune deficiency. Well, there's other kinds of immune deficiency, but it became human immune deficiency, HIV. But then you had to have the spectrum of, mm -hmm. is it just infected, but it, you know, the T cells are normal, or is it more advanced? But I think that we have to come up with a name that we're comfortable with. And then, as we did in HIV, I think the spectrum of disease, uh, and there's more advanced disease, which is AIDS. There's less advanced disease, which is HIV. Uh, and 
all of that then also changed when then there was therapy. And we're on that sort of brink now too, where we're trying to have a less stigmatizing name and we want it to be diagnosed. We don't want people to just say, oh, it's just a little bit of fat. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're on the, you know, on the precipice of having treatments and it will be better for the whole patient community and medical community if we can have a name that has a spectrum from early disease mm -hmm. to late disease that doesn't pigeonhole people or make them mm -hmm. feel bad. Thank you, and also for pointing out that indeed other fields have gone to same processes and problems. First microphone number 11, yep. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, my name is John House. I'm a humble uh, associate, non-member nurse practitioner. I, oh, when I'm listening to this, I kind of wonder whether it might be useful in some sense to uh, borrow from our behavioral health psychiatry colleagues in terms of putting it in, in the large respect of the steatic uh, liver disease, but then having different axes underneath because we seem to find that, yes, you can have viral components. You can have uh, what we would call NAFLD underlining as, you know, as well. Um, or there can be alcohol or many of these things combined. And it may be helpful in moving forward into the future in order to be able to rearrange somewhat what we're calling things based on that contribution. It also eliminates some of the stigma in the sense that, yeah, with the overarching, I can talk to my patients. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the access is uh, fibrosis. And I can tell them, you know, this, this is a possibility of what you might find or, or face in the future, or, and these are the things that are contributory for you um, in a way that works both for us and for the patients. Okay, thank you. Microphone number 10, and that will be the last intervention because we are running late, please. No problem. Thanks. I'm uh, Tom Jensen, uh, University of Colorado uh, endocrinologist. So um, I also wanted to kind of, you know, with the idea of the nomenclature, the, the idea of having more of an umbrella term, uh, kind of like we do with diabetes mellitus, you know, and it just comes from the idea that, you know, from when it was first discovered, obviously your urine was sweet, so as opposed to insipidus, right? And I think having a common term is helpful, like steatic, uh, steatotic liver disease, which we're trying to avoid some of the stigma. But we don't want to get um, too confusing, like our pediatric colleagues are saying, with like a metabolic associated liver disease or metabolic liver disease, because that can be confusing to even our colleagues. So for instance, in the uh, diabetes world, we ran into the problem with the term LADA, late autoimmune uh, late onset autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, because we'd use that term, and the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, physician community didn't understand it. So I even had a patient who went for bariatric surgery, and the team stopped all her insulin afterwards, and she went to DKA right afterwards because they didn't recognize that LA is really a type one diabetes, and so there's a lot of hedging that we need to mm -hmm. get rid of terms that are confusing for people. So I think mm -hmm. if we stick with the umbrella term of steatotic liver disease and then kind of break it down into some of its mm -hmm. aspects, whether there's non-alcoholic steatotic liver disease or alcohol steatotic liver disease, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like we do with diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, and not have confusing terms like we've seen with LADA or type 1.5, you know, people don't even know what that term means. Mm -hmm. What you know, do you have type mm -hmm. one or do you have type mm -hmm. two or something mm -hmm. in the middle? We don't want to confuse our patients or our um, colleagues with the terms that we come up with. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much and uh, very interesting contributions and a very lively debate. I would like to thank all who participated to the debate. A special thanks to the panelists and I hand now over to Maru and Phil for the final part of the session. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for, for staying on so, uh, so late. As you can see, it's not been entirely a straightforward process. Um, there's clearly a range of views um, here globally. Um, but I think the key thing, I think, was summarized at the beginning. I think the purpose here is trying to find something which, you know, reconciles very, you know, the very many issues around stigma, 
you know, something that defines what it is rather than what it isn't, and something which critically allows us to kind of incorporate new knowledge as we go forward. Um, as, as Jeff nicely summarized, you know, the, the point of a, a Delphi process is that, you know, there, is, there are opinions and then there are sort of a, a aggregation of opinions. And I think what was clear in the, in the final round was a, a view that the current name is not fit for purpose. And Arun, you know, has, has made the very valid comment that you don't want to go from one bad name to another one. But I think what was encouraging, I think, was the, the sort of view around an overarching term I think that the question as to what sits below that will be the, the challenge for round four. Um, I think the other really helpful area is around the understanding around um, patients that have um, what we currently call NAFL plus drinking above what you might, what, you know, above the currently recommended limits, but not necessarily at a level where you would, you would regard that as, as straightforward alcohol-related liver disease. And I think there's an opportunity there to study the biology in that situation. We need to understand how do you quantify alcohol intake in that setting? How do you quantify the relative contribution of alcohol or metabolic drivers in that setting? But I think that's, a, that's clearly come out from the, the survey. I think the other thing which I think is, is still a little bit to be developed is you know, what a change in definition may or may not look like, and that will be something we'll explore in the next round. You know, there may be a view that um, we don't change the definition, or there might be a view that we we subtly change it. The reality, I guess, is that many of the patients that we will see in, in a secondary care setting, and many of those that we'll consider for treatments, will, you know, 99% plus will likely have features of the metabolic syndrome. So in that sense, you know, potential change in definition would, would actually not move the needle too much. But that's something which the, the survey will look to. So I'll hand over to Mara now, who will outline the next, uh, the few, next few steps. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, I'd like to firstly thank you uh, all for participating in this uh, and being patient uh, with, with the process. Um, so um, I think we've, we've made a lot of progress today. Uh, I think we elevated uh, the discussion a little bit on around metabolic as a concept. Uh, we'll need to think a little bit more about that, I think. And uh, the overarching term, I think, came out pretty resoundingly clear. So I think what we can expect moving forward are probably a couple of very short uh, surveys to, to uh, finalize uh, those last uh, main questions, um, then uh, a uh, articulation of those findings in narrative form, followed by a period of public comment, and then um, moving forward, as uh, Donna actually articulated, that the importance of, of uh, having multiple and expanded stakeholders uh, involved so that we don't cause any uh, damage to the progress that's been made in the field uh, so far. Um, I think that's, that's all we have. You guys are free to go, I guess. Thank you very much for, for coming. Appreciate it.